I'm Becky Gerritsen. I'm the Executive Director of Eagle Forum of Alabama. Just to give you a little bit of background, Eagle Forum, if you don't know, is a conservative, nonprofit grassroots organization, and we advocate for public policy and legislation that helps the family, that uh, helps the nuclear family, really. We believe that strong families make strong communities. So we believe in things like smaller government, less taxes, personal responsibility, so we don't need Big Brother and the nanny state to tell us what we need to do. I think um, you're here because you support those values, so thank you. First of all, welcome Senator Barfoot, Representative Mike Holmes, Representative Reed Ingram, who will be dashing in here in just a minute, and Representative Charlotte Meadows. Thank you so much for being here. We are very blessed to have a good set of representatives. I don't have to get on y'all too much. Um, and you know what? We have good communication. So even if we disagree about something, the bridges are not burned and they're very approachable. And so I hope if you don't know who your representative is that you guys will come up afterwards and meet. Come on in. Representative Reed Ingram, thank you for being here. So we'll start with Senator Barfoot. And they, they each have a microphone. I, I want you just to tell us how long you've been in the legislature, the area you represent, and do you have a career outside of the legislative session? And if so, what is it? So you start us off. Well, let me, is this, can you hear me okay? Let me, uh, the, the last part of that question first, do I have a career outside the legislative session? I do, but I don't remember what it's like. Uh, <laughs> And, and that's kind of tongue in cheek, but uh, if you ask my wife, she's not sure who she's married to either. Uh, and because regardless of what people say as a part-time job, it really is a full-time job. And I think all these other folks can agree with that, that uh, in 2006, I ran against then Senator Dixon. And uh, uh, one of the regrets that I have looking back on that is in 2006, I said, can you believe it? He's making 38,000, Suzelle and I ran uh, in that race. Uh, can you believe it? He's making, what was it, $38,000 yeah. a year for a part-time job. Well, you know what? Uh, I get it. It's not really a part-time job. Um, and we may be in session part of the year and only part of the year, but it is a full-time full -time job. Uh, I am an attorney. I practice law in Montgomery. I uh, handle a variety of cases, juvenile cases, probate-type cases, uh, civil cases, and uh, some criminal defense as well. So that's kind of my daytime job where I try to feed the family, although they're getting a little thin here lately. I don't know how good of a job I'm doing with that. Been in the uh, legislature, was elected uh, four, three years ago now. Um, so this is my first term, and uh, it has been an eye-opening experience. Uh, Mike will probably tell you, we, we talked. I said, Mike, how long before you really figure out you know, what's going on uh, behind the curtain. And, uh, you know, what do you say, Mike? Second year, maybe even third. And, uh, and so, you know, sometimes everything you see, uh, at least on the Senate side, uh, that's going on on the floor is not exactly what it uh, looks like. And I'll give you an example of that. And that's, uh, uh, you know, you have somebody that's uh, maybe supporting a bill, but they're up there arguing against it. And uh, you go, why are they doing that? Well, it's not that bill that they're arguing against. They're just delaying getting to 10 bills down that they, they think is a bad bill. So, you know, there's some benefit, I guess, in, in delay, and you'll see that on from time to time on the Senate floor. And then, Becky, what was the last part of that? Uh, what area do you represent? Sure. Uh, all of Crenshaw County, about three-fourths of Montgomery County, and about half of Elmore County. Senator Chambliss represents the other half uh, in the Senate. And by the way, uh, he wanted me to make sure that he let y'all know uh, that he's been out of town with his daughter in uh, law school law somewhere school checking it out. Yeah, he would have uh, been here otherwise. Yeah. And same with Will Dismukes. He had to go out of town to Mississippi, and we texted today. He's sorry he missed it, but he yeah. would have been here also. So Thank anyway, you. pretty, pretty large district, all of Crenshaw County, about three-fourths of Montgomery, and then about half of Elmore County. Okay, great, thank you. Representative Holmes, how long have you been in? What area do you represent? And what is your career outside of the legislature? I think uh, this is about the end of my seventh anniversary. I was elected in a special election and I only served four or five months in that, that partial election and uh, ran for re-election. In fact, I qualified on the night I won that special election. I had to send a check to qualify 
to run again uh, back in that following November and won that election and then ran for re-election. So I'm in my seventh year. We'll finish out this term in 2022 and I will not run again. Definitely will not run again. <laughs> For a lot of reasons. I, it's, I'm just too old for this game. It takes a lot out of you, and uh, it's time to hand it off to somebody that's a lot younger and a lot more active than I can be, so this will be my last shot. Um, uh, Elmo County, I'm the, I think I'm the only representative of this group that lives in Elmo County now. We used to have others, but uh, we, we're all, all the rest of our delegation live outside, and it's an amazing delegation, too. We, we get a lot done in this delegation, and. Uh, We've got some, some rules, not so strict uh, book rules, but we've come to agreements and every time we have an election, we get the group back together and uh, is, this is the way we've been operating. We, do we continue to do this on local bills and how do we operate? So it's been an excellent delegation, even though it's changed. And the change primarily has been due to the growth in Elmore County. Uh, since I've been here, it's probably gone from somewhere around 80,000 people in the county and there's uh, estimates now, even though the census is going to be very late, which is a problem we'll wind up talking here about here tonight. What are we going to do? If they, if they stay with what they say they're going to do and not, not have that to us until September, the end of September, then there's no way we can get our redistricting done in time for the following year's elections. We've got people already announcing for these, uh, these races now. And uh, they will be allowed to start qualifying relatively soon now. So. We, we, whatever pressure you can put on your national officials to get the census done and out and get it to our people so that we can get our redistricting started, but that's very important. Uh, next, uh, do I have a career outside? Right, right now, I, uh, I'm a timber farmer. and that is a big part of mine and my wife's retirement, so I spend a lot of time at a tree farm. Uh, my corporate career was uh, executive management in agribusiness, my whole career pretty much. I started off as a physics teacher and a basketball coach. And so, but then it went quickly for, to the business world and spent 50 years in that, and uh, that, that was a lot of fun. But uh, this has been fun. What, what I've been doing is a lot of fun. Learned a lot, and, uh, uh, and there's still something to learn every week that you, you're, you're finding out. Charlotte, especially, is, the, is kind of the freshman in the group now, so she's learning a lot every week, and she's a fast learner. So that's, I don't think there's any other questions in that. Great. Thank you. All right, Mr. Ingram, right, Representative yeah. Ingram. Uh, Mike working? Can yes. You? All right. So, yeah. So what I do is um, I'm kind of a car dealer and a politician kind of go hand in hand. Wow. That's kind of like really bad. Money. Really bad. Yeah. Throw a tourney in there and yeah. then you're really <laughs> got <No>. three. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of like the Easter Bunny and the lawyer. They kind of go hand to hand, I guess. <laughs> but no, I, I actually closed the car lot up in October due to COVID. And um, I'm at Sweet Creek full time and I farm and... Um, and I, I tell you, it's like uh, Senator Barfoot said, it's, it's, it's almost a full-time job. So it's probably about four hours today, and we're not even back in yet. So it's, uh, but anyway, I enjoy it. I really do. And I represent Montgomery County and Elmore County geographically about a third. And I come up Emerald Mountain and then go in between the uh, casino and, and Fort Toulouse and head, head west. But, uh, and how long have you been in? I've been in since 14. Okay, great. All right, now the newcomer, Representative Meadows. Thank y'all. Hello, hello, hello. Am I on? Yeah. Just done here like that up here. Um, like they've alluded to, I was elected in a special session in November of 2019. Um, actually, one of the, my opponents is here. Hey, Todd, be good to see you. Uh, we'll have to catch up after this is over if you have a minute. Um, I was elected at the, after the death of Demetri Palizos and I've been in serv serving for last year, which doesn't really count, and so far half of this session. So this is really my second year. Happy to be there. My full-time job is taking care of my grandbaby, which, who lives in Birmingham, so I don't get to do that very often. Um, and my parents, who are here on the front row, and so I'm in the sandwich generation now because they have lots of needs. <laughs> but my grandbaby, our six-month-old, um, is the, the is the most important thing to us, and um, we do try to spend time with her. I'd have to agree, during the session, I'd say this is a really full-time job, and um, I have a lot of other hobbies, things that I do, but it's it's pretty consuming. Okay, that's great. Well, welcome to all oh, of you. Oh. I, all my district is within Montgomery County, up and down the Atlanta Highway, um, basically from Lee High School out to Chantilly, between the interstate and Atlanta Highway, and then includes some of Wind Lakes and Sturbridge. 
Okay, I do want to encourage all of you to take some time afterwards. Hopefully we'll end a little bit early so you can shake hands and exchange phone numbers. They are very approachable and sometimes there might be a piece of legislation that you are very concerned about and that will affect you or your family. Don't hesitate. They want to hear from you. So let me ask you this question. Because the session is so weird this year with COVID, we know that your emails, it's pretty much fruitless to send you an email because there are so many. Is there a way you prefer to be contacted? I prefer text message. My phone number is 334-324-8431. There's quite a few people in the audience who have it. If you want me to say that again, raise your hand. Or we'll say it at the end okay, we'll when, when they have the paper end. and pencil but out. I read text messages immediately. I actually do read my emails. The ones that come to the state house, I, they flash up and then they kind of disappear and I have to go back and look for them and technology is not my favorite thing. So I don't really love those emails, but the ones that come to my personal email account, I can find those again. So it's cbmetas at att.net, which is the same one I've had since 1990. So if you've ever emailed me, that's the best email address. Okay. Phone or text. Okay. And we'll be sure to share these at the end. I would say text and phone in, in that order. Uh, emails, I, I try to get to them all. I really go through them fast, though. And I, I, I've, you've learned after seven years what's really important. Is it, what's this about? Is this important to the, my district and to the state? And try to make it a quick decision. I go through them. And, and there's hundreds every day. And, and we've got a hot session with some really uh, controversial bills on the agenda this year. And so uh, that's this ramped up. I, I think everybody else here would agree. It's no comparison with the other years I've been there. It's literally two to 500 a day, and it's just very difficult to get. Then you've got to really cheer a pick them to do it. So I would say in that order is the best way. And any time you get a chance to go to an, a, a greeting like this where you face-to-face, -face, I, I really like that. I can see body language. I can hear your, what you're saying and what your concerns are. Yeah, and I, I would also say text is probably the best, uh, phone call second, and then email if you're going to send an email. Make sure you put where you're from because when we get emails, that we, literally, if there's a topic that goes on, topic, you know, you may get 500 emails, and some of them are form emails. And if somebody says, "Hey, I'm for this or I'm against that," well, you know what? Uh, I'm I'm happy to to listen to somebody in Huntsville, but it, you know, I don't represent the folks in Huntsville. So if you live in District 25 and you have a concern, question, or comment, put, you know. Put your address on there for me so I'll know that you truly live in, in District 25, and that way it will get, uh, get top priority. Okay, great. Now I'm going to ask one more question before we open it up to the audience. And, Mike, I'll start with you. Is every, I want everyone to answer this question, if you would. Do you have a priority piece of legislation that you want passed this year, or what is your biggest concern uh, legislative legislation-wise for this session? Yes, I got s several of my bills that are very important, and, and it's really coming to a, the cr a crisis level this week. We got uh, uh, the TNF team bill that you've heard me talk about for two years, if you've listened to me in the last two years. And TNF team is an uh, illegal drug, and in, in the FDA eyes, uh, they've turned it down for uh, class one uh, classification five times now, and for all the right reasons. That it's, it's a very dangerous drug, and the FDA has proved that over and over again. But yet. Uh, the distributors are allowed to sell it on convenience store shelves and gas store shelves here, here in Alabama. And in fact, we're not the only state. Virtually every state has a black market going on in this stuff, and it's big. It's grown so big in Alabama last year, we were able to get some pretty good numbers from some distributors. 180 million to 200 million a year last year. So that's a really important one. We've already passed it unanimously out of the House. This is the second year in a row we passed it unanimously out of the House. And we've sent it on to the Senate. Senator Barfoot here has been a huge help. The chairman of the, uh, the uh, Judy Committee upstairs in the Senate has, has got it on their agenda really quickly once we got it out of the House. We'll be, I'll be uh, presenting that bill in, in their meeting this week. So that one's really important. Another one's really important to me as close to my heart is the uh, Monument Protection Preservation Act. Uh, HB 242, it's, um, it's, it's in the uh, state government committee. Hopefully within the next couple of weeks we'll get it heard there and then get it on up to the Senate too. 
Uh, let's see the other one. I have one too. Then we got several of these floating around. We may wind up with some consolidation there, but a, a bill, uh, HB 241, that uh, actually the goal of the bill is to rein in the executive branch of our government. And uh, some of the stuff that I know, I know a lot of you are very concerned about is our, our uh, executive branch really overstepped their bounds. The, the, the language that they were going by goes back a long way. In 1972, I think, is the last time it was, it was uh, changed at all. So it's been a while but since it's been updated. But we were thinking about different kinds of situations. We haven't been thinking about pandemics. But uh, uh, they're usually, when we have a, a, an executive branch declaration of a state of emergency, it has to do with tornado or hurricane. That's our big ones. And we get those virtually every year, but this is the first time since the 19, early 1900s when we had a pandemic across the nation, and this, the current legislation didn't, didn't come in existence since. So we really, the governor uh, has pretty much free reign of, of how long these things last, so this bill tries to rein that in some, but yet we all realize that you, you can't call the legislature together every time we get a, a tornado threat or anything like that. We, we, so we, we need to leave it with the executive branch, but we need some limits on it so that you have a 14-day waiting period before you get a, a decision made on some of these things. So be it, because we can get the legislature together, or my bill calls for a special committee. And with very wide representation, I think there's 12 members on that committee, that, that can make that decision along with sign off with the governor and, and the, the state health department is too has is, is, is got some targets on it in this legislation because of the way that's gone in this pandemic as well. So that's, those are the three big ones to me. The one I'm concerned about, I've already mentioned, I won't spend a lot of time on it, but uh, we, we have to get the census information in because this is a redistricting time. We have to use this census to get redistricted and that's all tied to our coming elections next year. So if we don't get those, we, we won't even know which district our candidates are running for. So it's really going to be a mess if we don't get that census done and get this redistricting done. Okay, great. Representative Ingram. Yeah, so most of the bills that I'm carrying this year are, are smaller bills like local bills to help Elmore County, Montgomery County, and then I have a couple of bills. I chair County Municipal, and we have a lot of bills come through County Municipal. And so I try to focus on reading more of the bills to make sure we pass good legislation out of my committee. And so the few bills that I've got is a, um, is a uh, lead bill that we've been trying to get passed for a couple of years. And it's, uh, it's just on older homes, it's lead paint. And then another one is a, a tier two modification bill for state employees to be able to, to keep them without having to lose them because we're having such a hard time recruiting. And um, so really that's about it other than our local bills. But it's a pretty heavy load when you're a chair of a committee like that. So make sure that we have a good filtering process to make sure that we don't bring anything to the to the committee without being good. Great, thank you. Representative Meadows. Since I've never passed a bill yet, I'd like to see any of the bills that I'm carrying pass. Um, I have four that I'm carrying right now. Two are probably could pass as early as this week. The other two have not yet been heard in committee, and those are both to do with education and ed uh, school choice issues. Um, one, probably the bill that I really want to make sure it's SB 10 which I might want to talk about that in a little bit mm -hmm. but um, of course SB indicates if you're in the house that it's already gone through the Senate and we did I got an amendment put on it in the Senate Health Committee which is I'm on the health and the education policy committee so I'm yeah and we, we will take time at the end to so go into detail on that one okay because that's a pretty hot and that's something I was going to mention a few minutes ago. If you're emailing us, don't just say SB10, because unless it's something really big like SB10, I have no idea what HB477 is. Or there are hundreds of bills out there. There really are. Yeah. And I, I mean, if you would say this bill is about this and it's carried by this or the sponsor is whoever, that's a lot more helpful than any bill number, because I'd have to go look up the bill number. Um, so really, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting SB 10 onto the floor of the House. It's going to be controversial. This is the transgender bill banning the medical procedures, but we will talk about that at the end. And we passed it out of House committee right before spring break, so it was interesting. Lots of good discussion. And, and thank really you for your help. Working with Margaret Clark, who's the attorney for, with Eagle Forum, um, on, on the amendment. She was incredibly helpful and, and very gracious to let me have some input. So. Well, and it was really nice, too, that 
um, Representative Meadows was on the committee, so there were some questions that were being asked during the committee that the sponsor didn't have a quick answer to. The sponsor probably knew, but just was answering it different. And so I was able to text Charlotte and help clarify, and then she was able to say out loud in the committee and kind of reiterate what the answer was, which is very helpful. So thank you for that. I'll learn that on the school board. <laughs> <laughs> you had good training. All right, Senator Barfoot, your pet re legislation. Well, um, I guess the bill that, that I have that I'm most proud of so far is the special session bill. And just like Charlotte said, I, I'll be honest with you, it's my bill. I can't even tell you what SB number it is because you've got all these numbers floating through your head. But the special session bill basically gives the legislature through the uh, pro, pro tem as well as the uh, Speaker of the House by joint resolution can call us back into session. Alabama is one of only 14 states uh, where the legislature cannot call themselves back into session. Now there are some down potential downfalls to that, right? Uh, you don't want a, more, a runaway legislature that, you know, every time somebody sneezes, you think you got to, you know, come back in and correct it and fix it. But what uh, what the special session bill does is, is again by joint resolution of the Speaker of the House by the pro tem of the Senate, they can call us back into session, and on the day that we're back in. Uh, it takes two-thirds votes from each house, and if either house fails to get to that two-thirds vote, uh, then we go home. Uh, there, are, there's no business to conduct. And so, why is that special session uh, bill important? Well, if you look across America over the past year, you can look at California, you can look at New York, you can look at Michigan, and you can tell some of those governors uh, and what they have done. And you know, we have no authority in Alabama to change anything. I've, I had multiple calls over the past, uh, you know, summer and in the fall. Well, why can't you do anything? Well, you know, the legislature's uh, responsibility is to make and pass budgets or to pass budgets and make and pass laws. And you can't do that unless you're in session. So I think that would be is a very important bill. And uh, there was a House bill uh, that uh, I think Representative Becky Norgren had. Um, and th that did not get out of the committee, I think, in the House. and, and uh, I think she since filed it again. I don't know if it's in the same committee or a different committee, but uh, that uh, that special session bill passed, uh, my special session session bill passed uh, the uh, Government Affairs Committee, I believe unanimously in the Senate, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get it on the floor vote. And if we're able to, to uh, overcome maybe the Democrat filibuster on that, then we'll send it down to the House, and then that way they'll have have two bills to choose from the Senate bill version or the House bill version. Uh, one of the other bills that's not mine, but I am 100% um, behind, uh, Senator Watley uh, filed a um, is it HB, I mean SB. It was, a, it was pre filed, wasn't it? Is it? No, but not, I don't think so. Maybe, not it's H, maybe it's SB 95. It might have been, heck, we might have had 95 pre filed ones. But it is, uh, uh, as, as y'all are aware, Pursuant to the Emergency uh, Management Act, I believe, of 1955, the, uh, the state health officer is granted certain powers when an emergency is declared by the governor. Now, that's when it says 1955, that references the year that that Emergency Act uh, was envisioned and, and put into law. And certainly in 1955, the thought process probably wasn't a pandemic, but rather the Cold War was going on, right? Well, a lot of time has changed since then. And by the way, I've said this every time I've been asked, I think Dr. Harris, who I do not know, is probably a fine man. I've, I've never heard anything bad about him personally. He was in a terrible position. I mean, any time that you have something happens once in 100 years, uh, you're going to make some bad decisions or choices. So it's not against him. It's not even against that office. What it is about is uh, Senator Watley's bill would those executive orders that the state health officer is issuing, it would make it so that the governor would issue those orders, the top elected executive member of the state of Alabama. Second thing it would do, it gives some authority to the legislative branch. So even after those orders are issued, whatever they may be uh, dealing with in emergency situations after a specific period of time, and Mike, this may it's mimic companion, com companion to your bill. Okay, and I, and I hadn't seen your House bill yet? It's SB 97. SB 97. Okay. Yep. Yep. So, uh, but anyway, but so Mike, Mike and Senator Watley on the same page. I was proud last year at the end of the session to co-sponsor, be his first co-sponsor on that bill, 
and I'm his first co-sponsor on the uh, this year. I think listed. So we've got that in a position on the Senate floor. It passed uh, passed the uh, committee, Senate committee, and now it's on the Senate floor. It was up for debate uh, two weeks or so ago, and uh, there was some delay by the Democrats, and so it was carried over. And I suspect we'll be seeing that again relatively soon. So look forward to, to voting on that. Okay, great. Now we have a lot of issues. We have COVID issues. We have Second Amendment. We have gaming bill. We have transgender bills. So I was going to just have people come up, but if you want to raise your hand, I'll come hold the microphone for you. I know there are, I know there are people here with questions. Yes, ma'am. Uh, first, I'd, uh, nice to meet all of you. Mike, I've, we've met somewhere some other time. Uh, but uh, I guess, um, so Representative Ingram, thank you for sharing that. I think that one of the biggest problems that we have is we're ignorant of the process. Um, the constituents don't know how to contact you. It's only lobbyist groups, big you know, national lobbyist groups who send things out and say, oh, contact your congressman or senator in D.C., send an email. And these are really just efforts to generate funds for these lobbyist groups that may not actually really be representing the position like we think they are, but they're securing jobs for a lot of people in Washington. There's a big game going on in Washington that people are not aware of. And there's a lot of division that's going on because we don't know our history. We don't know Asian history. We don't know that the, it was divide and conquer. And that's what they have effectively done is, you know, it's conservatives ver versus liberals. And we just keep firing bullets at each other. And it, we can't have a civil conversation because we become barbaric. So my question is, you know better than anybody else, your laws don't make a difference only changed hearts do. Because a, ch a law, unless there's an effective consequence, which is extremely hard to do, what are you gonna do? Just fill up more prisons? Is that, is that changing behavior? It doesn't work, right? That's correct. Okay, so my question is, what are you doing as leaders to try to get and motivate the people you represent to start doing what our founding fathers had in mind, which is we, the people, take responsibility for ourselves. We are civil to our neighbors, whether they agree with us or not. We're willing to listen to an opposing view in a civilized manner instead, the bullying and the name calling that goes on. Well, I don't know how to answer the question, but let me just start off saying this, you know, I don't really consider myself as a politician. I was motivated to get into politics for a couple of reasons. One, my great-great-grandfather that I was named after, Robert Treat Payne, signed the Declaration of Independence. And that's what motivated me to get into politics. Another reason was we didn't have any representation in my district. I was, when I first ran for office, I was a commissioner. And we didn't have, it's kind of like um, Mike was saying, he's the only representative that lives in Elmore County. Well, I was the only commissioner when I got elected that lived in the unincorporated area. And that just represented, Montgomery was only 19% of the whole county. So all the other four lived in the city. So, you know, I, I, I don't know how to answer your question other than I'm very um, proactive to be able to fix a problem and not put more laws on it. I don't like a lot of laws. I like to get to the root of the problem and and instead of mopping the floor, fix a leak. And we do have a problem with our prisons, and, and we can open up a whole can of worms with that, and I think we're going to get into that later. But, but I hope that answered your question, uh, maybe. It didn't. Okay, can you repeat that one more time then? Well, get okay. Back to you, okay. What? I didn't call you a politician. I know, I know you didn't. I, I called you. you. Okay. I know you That's didn't. part of the problem. So, yes, ma'am. You all are accepting the title of politician. Stop it be leaders. Okay. The question was, as a leader, what are you thinking about and doing to inspire us, we the people? She's doing her job. Right. She's doing her job. She has educated us. Newcomers, obviously, you hear there's no accent, right? I'd, we would know nothing about Alabama if it wasn't for her. Yeah, and I think that's the reason all the four of us are here tonight 
is, you know, and any time I have that opportunity, I want to be in front of our people, you know, and not only the people in my district, but yeah, we want to do everything we can do to keep you informed and engaged. And that's, you know, you know, uh, most of the people in this room I know, and most of them, if they have any issues, they call me, or if they want to talk about something, they come by and see me, you know. But I, I do want to do everything I can do to, to do that, to help. Okay, we have an active duty member question. Hey, good evening. Thanks for uh, being here this evening and having this forum. Uh, this question actually may seem kind of trite. I am active duty. <clears throat> it doesn't have anything. Uh, thank you. Uh, doesn't have anything to do with uh, active duty. So uh, I live in Elmore County, uh, Jasmine Hill area, and so I haven't been a resident of, of the area for that long. And uh, I am interested in hearing about uh, the transgender and all of those things, care about those things so much. I'm conservative. And so here's, here's two questions. Um, when I drive the roads around here, I I'm almost ashamed because there's so much trash on the roads to the point that I, our, our family actually got out and, and did a litter pickup. And, and so is there a bill that can enforce harsher penalties on littering and the enforcement of such penalties? Because I would be thrilled to, to not see um, so much trash on, on our roadways. And the second question is this, <clears throat> is there any conversation about overhauling Alabama's tax code to make it competitive to Florida or Tennessee or Texas or even West Virginia is in the news that West Virginia is looking to remove their state income tax. Um, I'm a little bit ignorant on, on all of Alabama's tax code. So I'd be interested in those two topics. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mike, I don't know if you want to take the, since you're in the Jasmine yeah, I'd really, area. I'd love to because I really have blooded my nose for the last two years with the tax situation. I sponsored for the last two years uh, a movement called the Fair Tax, which does away with income tax, state income tax completely. And it's a net revenue neutral proposition. And you look around at uh, states that have done it, and you, as you would guess, of our top 10 economically performing states in the nation, eight of them have no state income tax. And you can name them all, Florida, Texas, just, just go on and on, where they have real prosperity, they have no state income tax, and it works. It's, it's just, it's a two, it's a 600 pound gorilla that I could not move. Spent a lot of money, time, energy, and effort, and finally just, just gave up. It, just, it, was, it was not doable in my lifetime, it doesn't appear. But uh, uh, that, that's a great idea, and I wish I could give you something to tell you that somebody's really working on that, uh, that, that there's gonna be a big tax uh, uh, re redoing and sometime in the very near future. I don't, even, I don't see it on the horizon because so many people got weary with me pounding on them with fair tax for the last two years that they don't want to hear about it anymore. But um, one other thing, I want to go back to the other question. One of the, one of the things that we do, and I know I've, I've kept up with mine for a couple of years, and it always turns out to be over 50% of my time is spent stopping really bad bills. It's just as important as coming up with a new bill and introducing it. So you need to be prepared to fight, and I mean fight like hell, because you're going to be fighting a lot of really tough, savvy people that want this pa passed, and they've got all the right motivations to get it passed. But uh, you, you've, got to, you've got to have the right coalitions with your, your co colleagues, and, and you know, know how to use the filibuster and, and do everything you can to get it stopped, and it can be done. We've stopped a lot of really bad legislation. Does anyone want to take the trash issue and maybe I'll, maybe there's a suggestion that's not a law? Yeah, and you know, it's it's a problem in every county, in every municipality. And and we do have laws out there, local laws and state laws as far as littering. It's just being able to catch that person when they throw it out the window is so aggravating to me. And every time I stop and pick up trash in front of my house or my business, I try to find it's any evidence of a name or anything um, to to do anything I could do to prosecute this person, but finding that person when they throw it out is very pro, it's, it's just impossible. But uh, we, uh, Imram, let's see, Elmore County, and there was another, uh, the county commission, and I think maybe we Tumka got together and did a litter pickup here recently, I saw. But, um, you know, we just got, it shows up more in the wintertime because there's no grass and they're not cutting, and it's pretty bad, but yeah, I, I, it's in every county, mm -hmm. unfortunately. All right. Hey, guys. Um, my question is kind of just a general feel question as far as the COVID 
stuff. Uh, I've been studying a lot overseas, different responses, different governments, more authority, less authority, blah, blah, blah. What would be the three things that y'all think we got right, generally, as far as how Alabama specifically handled the COVID crisis and three things we got wrong, in y'all's opinion? Because I want to feel that relative to some other things I've seen and experienced. Thanks. I don't know who wants to start that. You know, I, I, this is not to demean anybody, but you know, it's easier to pick out the wrong than it is the right, right? So personal responsibility uh, uh, plays a big part of it. Had this conversation with a judge today in a courtroom in Montgomery, and he said, you know, when the governor's uh, executive order uh, expires, which is it's not his her executive order, but when the executive order expires on April the 9th, we're not sure what we're going to do in Montgomery, if we're going to be able to continue to hold court or not. And I said, well, you know, I'm, listen, I'm in front of him. He's a judge. I owe him the respect of the position, and I actually like him. I said, well, judge, I said, you know, I think by now, whether it's good information or bad information, there's enough information for people to make informed decisions, right? If I owned a store and said, you can't come in here unless you wear a mask, I should have that ability, right? If I owned a store and said, you can't come in here wearing a mask, I should have that ability. And then guess what? When people understand, you know what? You can't come in here unless you're wearing a mask. Some of you may say, I'm gonna go to another store then. Or you can't come in here if you're wearing a mask. Maybe you don't feel comfortable and you go to another store, but it's personal responsibility and freedoms. And I think that's a key. I mean, listen, when you're dealing with something the first couple of weeks, I'll give some grace, okay? Uh, I think when you give up liberty for too long, it becomes uh, a bad thing. That's 100% the case. But I think by now, if you don't have the ability to make your decision about whether you're going to wear a mask, not wear a mask, what are you going to do? I mean, it's been out there, and so I think at that point uh, has, been, has, has been drilled in our heads. So. I got a quick follow-up. Okay. The, like my, my thought process is I'll have my second uh, inoculation on April Fool's, whether that, <laughs> for what it's worth. Uh, and then I might, tells me that after about two weeks of that, I should be okay. Like, I think I'm okay anyway, but as far as socially, like at what point should I you know, start, and it's that warm fuzzy of respecting other people and that sort of thing, but we can't all walk around with masks forever. And I wear my mask, but I don't think socially it's long-term, this is a good thing and it gives a government too much authority. Sorry. Okay, back to the original three best things we did or and the three worst. Are we, we still waiting for two more best things? Yes. I got one. Okay. Go ahead. Else. No, I don't have a good thing. I have a you, bad you don't thing. have a good thing? <laughs> Amen to that, sister. Well, I'm, one good thing I think we, we did really right, and I'm going to give our former president, Donald J. Trump, the credit for this, but he reacted very quickly in cutting off uh, international travel. Very quickly. And he got a lot of criticism, criticism for that. He got the people just came up in arms. It really put a ding in the airline transport, all those people lost a lot of money over that, but it, it was the right thing to do. There's no, many te no telling how many people would have poured out of China knowing what they were facing. They would have kept coming in the thousands if we had allowed them to. So we, Donald Trump got that right, and uh, it, it was a hard decision and a not a popular decision when he did it, but it was the right thing to do. I didn't know we could count federal yeah. <laughs> pos positives. It was part of the pandemic. If it's that hard to find. Well, you know, I, I, no matter what decision you do, as far as the governor, not everybody's going to like it. The mask man mandate, I think, was necessary. Uh, should we already be out? Yeah, I think we should be out by now. But, you know, as far as, you know, it's not a lot of times the people that are informed that have a problem. It's the people that are not informed and don't want to be informed that we have a problem with. And that's the problem in the lower income areas, whether it be white or black or whatever. And I think there's a lot of things that we probably took to the extreme just because to protect everybody. Uh, we, I think, all have sense enough to, to know what we got to do and what we don't do. Uh, I probably don't wear a mask 
like I should. I don't wear it at my market. I do wear it when I'm in the kitchen. I do wear it when I'm serving food most of the time. But I think that, you know, I've had it. I've had my vaccine. And I probably wouldn't have had the vaccine if I hadn't had it. Uh, you don't really know until you have a bad case of COVID what it is. And, and I laid up for 11 days. And people that know me know I don't lay up. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm very um, active, but it, it knocked me on my knees. Um, and so I was, uh, when it became available, I raised my hand to get it. I probably wouldn't have. My wife still doesn't. They're probably going to get the shot. But I think we did a lot of things, you know, we don't know like it is a 100-year pandemic. Hopefully it won't come again in the next 100 years, but who knows the right decision? I think the people that, that were in charge took a proactive approach, and I think that um, they had to make that hard decision, right or wrong. Representative Meadows, go ahead. I was going to say, I've been, for, for the last couple of months, I've been trying to get vaccines to a group home in um, Montgomery that has 12 medically fragile people. And finally, after threatening to go to the media, that was an idea I had for my dad, and then you know, basically screaming from a mountaintop well, yesterday by email, I got response today. And so tomorrow, my 12 people are gonna get vaccinated. Um, but the problem is their plan was for somebody like me to stand on a mountaintop and scream until they got their little fannies in a truck and drove across town to give 12 doses to some people that are medically fragile. That's not a plan, that's a reaction. The plan doesn't exist to immunize the other 3,000 facilities in the state of Alabama that have medically fragile people in them. And that is a crying shame. And so, and, and I know y'all probably all have your own vaccine horror stories. I know when the, the 800 number first came out, my dad called the number 500 times that weekend. <laughs> I mean, he counted, and I said, Dad, you don't really need to count. I, we, that's not important. But it, his phone told him. So you know, this is a complete disaster in terms of the vaccine delivery. And I do know Scott Harris. He is a very nice person. But today I found out that there's a person, a Dr. Taylor, in charge of, vac charge of vaccine administration for the whole state. And I said, why did I not hear from you two months ago or even two weeks ago? Well, Miss Meadows, I didn't know your name. She still didn't know my name. But... I didn't know who you were until today. I'm like, okay, y'all are swatting at flies when you've got a big pic, you, you've got to think big picture. So that's been a disaster. The other, can I say one more thing that's been a mess up? Closing schools down yes. has been a complete yes. stupid, stupid decision. We have been pressuring them and So the school that I had any purview over stayed open the whole year. <laughs> Lead Academy, which is the charter school in Montgomery, closed down last spring when we were told we had to, and we opened up in August and been in person ever since. Elmore County did the same. They opened on schedule this year. They've had no serious problems. It's just been, a, I mean, it's gone way better than expected. And, it's, and our kids, even the kids that went back on time, they're really concerned now. They, had, they gave them an option uh, to, to do a uh, virtual, and I think about 20% of the kids did. The, the absentee rate on those 20%, are, they're, not gonna, they're not getting the work done. So that tells you about how, how well online training goes. Uh, if you don't, it's not required, no testing, no way to follow up on it. Half those kids are not going to graduate that thought they were going to graduate. They're going to have to repeat a year. They're going to have to do whatever they're going to do if they want to graduate from high school because our superintendent is not going to put up with that. If they don't do the work, they're not going to get any credit for it. So, but their, their actual in-person school has worked great. I give a lot of credit to our superintendent, Richard Dennis. He's a great one, and he's doing a good job for this county. I want to Let me bring up, there is a bill that went through the House and has had that House bill passed? About, can it, yes. There's a bill that people thought said mandatory kindergarten. What it said is that you have to be prepared for first grade. And we got that passed through the House and I hopefully it will go through the Senate. The reason we're pushing that right now is because so many children across the state stayed home and skipped kindergarten. And if they come to kindergarten, I'm sorry, if they just skip kindergarten altogether and come to first grade completely unprepared, then those teachers and those children that are prepared to teach first grade are going to be 
really up a creek without a paddle. So we're trying to make sure that every child that comes to first grade is prepared for first grade and has the necessary, I mean, it's a simple assessment. Do you know your name? Do you know your ABCs? Do you know your colors? And those are things that if you don't already know those things, your address, your phone number, you don't need to be in first grade. You need to go to kindergarten. There's no age restriction on it, but it's something that came through education policy. There was probably some concern among some of y'all that we were trying to force people to do kindergarten. That was not it. We're trying to force people to be ready for first grade because it penalizes those who are, if you put a bunch of kids or you know, a third of the, 20% of the class in that classroom with teachers who are trying to teach first grade who then have to go back and remediate. And that's the problem that already exists, but it's going to be exacerbated by COVID. Okay, stand up. Keith. All right. Um, Keep it short, Keith. <laughs> this is to all of y'all, and this is in y'all's court. This is on elections. Now, Alabama has been praised for how well we've conducted elections. However, comma, we can do better. My concern is there's too many loopholes, there's too many loose ends, there's too many cracks that people can try to manipulate when there's a crisis like COVID. And uh, let's, let's go with absentee ballots. I talked to Secretary of State John Merrill. We know that for the November 3rd election, they had an open period for absentee ballots, so let's say for two weeks or more. Now, to me, that was not absentee, as that was early voting. There are strict rules for absentee ballots. You must sign it, you must have witnesses, you must have an ID, and all of these other things. And I heard more than one story about how those rules were being brushed aside under just, just for expediency. Well, we can't do that. It's, it's times of crisis where things are tested to their nth degree. There's got to be, y'all have got to make uh, solid rules, solid penalties when rules are broken. And those rules must be followed. The election center managers must follow them. They cannot shy, uh, just kind of breast them aside whenever they feel like it. So some type of legislation should be introduced that's going to crack down on any of these loopholes and say there will be criminal penalties for election center managers that do not abide by the rules that have been passed by y'all for our elections. Article 2, Section 1, Clause 2, as we know very well now, talks about the legislatures will make the rules for elections. No one else, not judges, not Supreme Courts, not, a, not Secretary of States, not Attorney Generals, the legislature. So on the, there was a package of election bills that just came through. Tell us your thoughts on those. The House passed out uh, last week, I believe it was on, wasn't it Charlotte, we had that week, well, week before last week, took, took last week off, the week, last business week we actually passed it and it was an all day sucker. I mean, it was filibustered from the start to the finish and we had to wind up cloturing every bill, I believe, on the agenda for that day. And cloture just simply means you force a vote. And we were, I think we've been more than, more than courteous to the, to the minority. Uh, they, we have a super, super majority. We've got 77 Republicans and only 23 Democrats. So that's a really huge majority. But we try to be courteous and listen to them. And so, but it, that makes a long day when you got, I've forgotten how many bills in that package. Help me out, uh, read them, Charlotte, seven? Five bills plus two Democrats. Okay, seven, seven, total seven total bills. They all passed the House, so they're on the way to the Senate. I'm not sure where they will be there, so they're on the way. But, and I've got another one that it was an afterthought that I'm gonna drop this, this coming week, to, probably tomorrow, if I can get some co-sponsors rounded up tomorrow, tomorrow morning, that John Merrill thought about this kind of an afterthought, and he asked me what I'd do it this late day, and I said, John, you know as well as I do, it's going to be very difficult to get through this, since this other package is already, is already on the track. But we're going to try, and I'll, I'll get that one introduced tomorrow too. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of activity. We're very much aware that it's our responsibility, and I agree with you. We've done a good job, and I'm, I'm not patting ourselves on the back. The people at the, the top, the, the Secretary of State's office, have done a great job. The ma great majority of our voting officials in the county level 
do a great job. They're very proud of their security, and they, they bring the charges when they're necessary. They go after the convictions, and a lot of convictions you never hear about. In fact, uh, the Secretary of State actually uh, did two or three lawsuits against some of the election officials in some of the counties and got conviction. He won, he won those suits already. It's gone, it's gone that fast. I do. That brings me to a point. Suzelle's got a question, but do you all remember the case where the... Um, Attorneys General signed on to the Pennsylvania case, and our Attorney General did not, and everybody was upset about that. Well, I found out the reason why we didn't have standing because we had election officials in Alabama who willy-nilly changed the rules. It's what we were fighting against in this Pennsylvania case, and so we, we had dirt on our face, and that's the reason we weren't enjoined in that case. Okay, Suzelle. I'll make it very brief. I just want to say, first of all, these are four of our best guys up there. Oh, I'm telling you, they are. They are. And I, I, I call them all the time. They know that. And if you can't get Senator Barfoot, he's got a great secretary. She will track him down for you. So, and I feel like we are speaking to the choir tonight. We really are. These are our best conservatives right here tonight. And so, um, and I'm not just saying that. I mean that because we're on them all the time. Um, also, if I can take this quick brief thing to announce, we've got a new Republican candidate for our Senate 78, the House District 78, Miss Loretta. Grant. She just signed up, didn't you, Loretta? Yeah, they just talked her into it. So we're so excited. We're going to try to take that seat um, back. Um, as a, and she's, she's the one that has the gazette. So this lady has been around Alabama politics for many years, and we need her there. We need, we, this, I told her, I said, this gray hair is going to bring tremendous amount of wisdom to that legislature. We need it. That's not my question. That's my, that was, I was, that was just my, my introduction. Uh, you're welcome. So y'all help her out, okay? Um, what I'd like to say is two things very quickly. Okay, one is I got two bills I'm concerned about. One is the hospital bill where we're now letting um, relatives back in to see the hospital. I mean, relatives to, to hold the hospitals accountable and also our nursing homes. I don't know if y'all thought about this, but I'm a grandmother of six and I've recently have experienced our daycares are doing the same thing. We're not, um, we do not have the access to daycares the same way there is no access to the hospitals or there was not access to nursing homes. And so any care facility that is going to be taking care of a loved one, there needs to be that accountability and access into daycares. So if somebody, somebody, I don't know if anybody here is, is working on that at all, but if so, we really need I, to. I think there's a bill on our calendar tomorrow, because I've read that, and it, I wouldn't have read it if it didn't come up tomorrow. Uh, Senator Gudger from Coleman, uh, we passed in, that SB, and I forget what number it was, is but it in the health that may be down in the House now. Is it part of the hospital access bill? It might be. Okay, good. We just need, because we, you know, any care facility that's going to have our loved ones in it, there needs to be accountability. We need to get in there and see what's happening, whether it's our parents or our grandchildren. Okay, very good. Awesome. Now, that was my second, my second question is, my name is Suzelle Josie, and I'm here to stop the expansion of gambling in the state of Alabama. So I want to know each one of you, and by the way, it is not an answer to say, um, I'm going to let the people vote on it. That don't count. That won't count, okay? I need a yes or a no. I'm either going to vote against stopping the expansion or I'm going to vote for, for expansion. It don't count if you say I'm going to let the people do it. I'll be, I'll be glad to take the second one. Uh, two years ago, I voted in favor of Senator Albritton's uh, lottery bill. Uh, it died in the House. Uh, I think that was uh, SB 220, maybe, if you want to go look back it up from two years ago. Two weeks ago, I was a no vote on uh, Senator Marsh's bill. That primarily was not on the merits of it, but rather the procedure, and let me explain that. 
there was a, a constitutional amendment that we voted on on the floor that day that referenced some 20, maybe 30 more times general law. That's not existing general law. That was general law that would be in the enabling bills that at that point in time had not been introduced, discussed, debated, or passed. And, you know, we chastise the Democrats in Washington, D.C., uh, and say, well, you could pass it and then read it later. But that would have been a vote, in my opinion, on a bill, a constitutional amendment that uh, referenced, as I said, as proposed or as provided in general law, as provided in general law. Well, you don't know what that general law is going to say. And so that was the purpose of my no vote then. Could I be a yes vote? I could be. But let's, I, no, I was already a, a yes vote on the lottery. I, no, 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 I was two years ago. I, what I'm saying is, is that that's the reason I voted no two weeks ago on the gaming bill. And if that comes up in that order again, I will continue to be a no because it is important to make sure that you know what that constitutional amendment has in it. Are you a yes or no? There is no, there is a, Senator McClendon's lottery bill. That's the only one out there now. Senator Gudger's is still in there. I could be a yes vote on that. Yeah. Could be. I could be. Absolutely. <laughs> three one five three four two six. Been there seven years, and I've never voted for one yet. And uh, and part of that is I've, I've learned a lot about that industry, and I can't make the numbers come out that this is a net gain for Alabama. Folks, you got to go back and figure out what the net social cost is of widespread gambling. And it costs our people of the state far more money than it brings into the state coffers. We have to spend it. We have to spend it and spend it and spend it so it doesn't come out on paper to me. Um, so the, the, even worse, I, I think I want to get this out too, that the bill, uh, uh, Del Marsh's bill uh, that failed, I was so tickled with that. I was very surprised when that happened. He's, he's been so popular and been so powerful in the Senate that I thought he would get that out. Folks, if you didn't read it, you don't want to. It would keep you up and with nightmares. It, it was so complex and so convoluted, and it was an octopus growing in 40 different ways. And I guarantee you, if we'd passed that and enacted that, you would not recognize Alabama in 10 years. It would not be the same state. The gambling lo the lobby from gambling would run the state from A to Z if we did that. Mm -hmm. All right. Representative Meadows. If it's a combined bill, I'm a no. If it's a separate gambling bill, I'm a no on gambling, and I'm yes on the lottery under certain circumstances. If, it go, if the money from the lottery were to go to the places that I agree with, which would be education. So that, that, it would have to go to education for me to... Well, okay, let me go to the next question, and then I've got some more over here. Okay, I want to know if there is any plan of how to protect Alabama if Washington passes H.R. 1 or the Equality Bill? Good question. I said I was a lawyer. I didn't say I was a constitutional lawyer. Uh, I'll say this, that you'll see moves by different states, and I hope Alabama's part of that, where um, we invalidate uh, certain aspects or portions of federal law. You'll see there's a Senate bill, uh, Senator uh, Gerald Allen has one that I suspect will have as it relates to uh, firearms or mandating state uh, uh, offices or officials to, uh, to um, enforce federal law. And uh, that could be a route that we try to go on a whole host of things. You know, the Tenth Amendment's a very important part of the Constitution. And uh, for far too long we have uh, kind of ceded that authority and right uh, to the federal government. And, you know, it wasn't so long ago that uh, if, you, if you spoke in favor of the Tenth Amendment, you got called names. Um, once upon a time, maybe, maybe those names might have fit. But the Tenth Amendment is much more uh, than just about race. It's about each state being a microcosm of the people that live in that state. And the federal government shouldn't have an overbearing relationship on any of the 50 states. So uh, I think that uh, I think that I think that you will see that, and and um, you know, and, and quite honestly too, I think that um, 
you know, there are opportunities. For instance, you know, uh, President Biden now, and, and we did this in our church, and, and I'm, I, I support this 100%. We took a moment to pray for him and the vice president, as, as I think we all should, mm -hmm. and that those right and proper decisions are made. Now, um, you know, we'll look back on history and we'll see, and my guess is is that we in this body, in this group, probably will not support many of the decisions that come out of Washington over the next two years or maybe four years, but I think we should pray for, for the leadership and for God to uh, lead God and direct him. We'll, you know, that's, that's been our prayer. Okay. Another retired family. Thank you for your service. Um, in regards to the lottery, you, you had mentioned possibly, I'm going to guess, if it goes to education, then you would be for it? Or the lottery, yeah. So when I ran in 2019, I told the people that I was campaigning to that I would allow them to vote on a property tax for Montgomery County because that was, we knew that was coming. And then the next question is, how do you, what will you do with the lottery? I said, I'll, I'll allow it to come to a vote of the people so i won't stand i won't i won't vote no if it's a lottery that i can and what i said then if it's a clean lottery where the money goes to something that's you can prove it obviously and it goes to education because i think the the guy that was i don't know everybody's names but the one that was presenting it weren't they saying that it was going to go to education we haven't had a just a plain lottery bill in the house yet all we've okay. had, I mean, in that fact, was in combination. We haven't had anything in the house yet. That bill's dead. Right. That one's Another dead. One, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I know that the governor is very much for it, and so today. Yeah. <laughs> where was she three weeks ago when Del Marsh was bringing it? I mean, it was. She could have been for it then, and he might have gotten two more votes. I don't know. I, honestly, what I heard was if he had brought it and insisted on a vote two weeks sooner. He would have had it passed, so he he missed the sweet spot. You don't think so? I heard that. So the the bill that the, that Dale Marsh brought was nothing like what the governor wanted. The governor did not support that bill, and I can tell you that firsthand. I spoke with the governor on that, and I don't know that the end of the day that Dale really wanted that bill to pass in the last 24 hours. Me and Senator Barfoot talked about that. I don't know if you agree or not. We talked about it on the air on. Oh, no. But if he wanted it to pass, he wouldn't have waited until those two people were out that were absent that day, whatever. But, but it was not a good bill. And let me tell you something about, and I'll take about 30 seconds, maybe a little longer. On the education component that I talked with the governor on, if we could do a reverse student loan. So if we were to go in and do something, now don't, don't take this that, that I'm going to support the bill uh, on a lottery. But this is the way I will fight it if we don't have this in there. And I'm going to bring the amendment if it's not in it. Um, so if we were to do, we, we're paying too much money now for student loans. The, the students are and the, the state is on grants. So if we were to turn that around and say, hey, at the end of the four years on your, on your loan, that when you get a job and land a job here in Alabama, we'll pay that loan back on a percentage basis. Say if we're, lo we're short on, um, on um, engineers, we'll pay 100%. It's whatever. It's a moving target. But what we're doing is we're paying, just like Georgia is paying for these student loans with, with the lottery, and they're leaving and going to another state. So we've got to have jobs. If we're going to educate our kids in Alabama, we've got to, they, they can go to any college in the country, any country, any college in the world. And long as they land that job, we'll pay that student loan back. And that's something the governor really liked, and we're working the, the kinks out of it. And I think that's going to be in the education component if it does pass. But I'm still not supporting it. I think that, too, um, I think the aspect, we have family members, and they were involved in the, in the gambling industry, and they lost everything. So, yeah, we say that it benefits the education or it, and it, it benefits the, the state, but... Is it really because they, they, they weren't well off to be in the first place gambling, but they ended up going bankrupt. They lost everything, lost their home, lost, you know, lost their family. Um, and so then, like one of you had mentioned, the, the payoff isn't that great anyway, yet we're destroying Alabama families. So I guess that would be my, my big concern is, is it, is it really worth it? 
In my opinion, it's not. And let me tell you why. You know, most of the profits on this is on the scratch off and not so much on the lottery numbers itself. And the payback is very small. So you have that dad beat dad just sitting around these convenience stores and spending his check instead of paying child support and buying things. They're spending it on that pot of gold that he thinks he's going to find at the end of the rainbow. And there is no return, period, you know. Real quick, when it comes down to the lottery, I already talked to uh, Senator Barfoot about this. And I'm sorry, Charlotte, you're not going to like this comment. I'm tired of everything for the children. That Montgomery County property tax was ridiculous. Until we hold people accountable at that dead gum school board down there, and you work with them, and say, no more money until the numbers go up. Because by God, I went to school, high school in Silicon, Alabama back in the 70s, and I'm get, got a better education then than we're coming out of what's coming on down here. And we got to tell them, no more money. I work for big corporations. I had million dollar budgets I had to minister. I had to justify them. And I had goals that had to be met. If those goals weren't met, guess what happened? I got, I got replaced. Now, it didn't happen. I, got, I met my goals. But the problem is they're not meeting the goals. And if they don't meet the goals, they need to say, strike three, you're out. Yeah, I'm with uh, Bama Carey. And uh, we're supposed to be a Second Amendment a friendly state. And we've got some bills going in, in the legislature, some of them still in the committee. We have a, a, a Second Amendment sanctuary bill, and we've got constitutional carry. The constitutional carry has been in the legislature for years. And we have states all over the United States passing the same two type bills, and we can't get them through our legislature with a super majority. And I don't understand that. I really don't. Yeah, Sheriff's Association. Yeah, BCA, BCA, and the Sheriff's Association. And, and y'all are in their back pockets. You need to get out of their back pockets. And BCA well, let me, let me is tell, let me, let me Business Council that. of Alabama, for those of you who are new and may, may not know what that means. Let, let, me, let me address it. First of all, I don't, I don't know about anybody else, but BCA, I don't know where the BCA comes in with it, but because uh, BCA, I've never heard anything about a gun bill from the BCA. The Sheriff's Association is adamantly opposed to uh, any type of open carry. Uh, this is not open carry. This is constitutional carry. Yeah. And, and it's not about the sheriff's, it's about us. It's no, no. About the you, 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 you said you named two groups. I'm addressing both of your concerns. You're exactly right. The Sheriff's Association has been against it. There is Senator Allen has filed a uh, constitutional carry bill again this year. He also has the Sanctuary City Bill, which I referenced just a minute ago. Those bills may very well get a hearing in the Judiciary Committee coming up here shortly. I don't know what's coming out of the House, but those are two bills in the Senate that may actually get a hearing. So just, just want to make sure we were clear about that. BCA, I have no idea. Never heard BCA uh, come out in favor or against either one of them. Never taken a position that I know of. I don't know about y'all, but I last question and you've waited so patiently okay i've got comments to go with my questions but it's short i said why can't we get figures on the deaths by cause from the alabama department of public health i've asked for them from them and from the governor they refer you to the website they're out of date like three or four years they say we don't have them and i said why does the public deaths by cause per year is that like, what you're asking for like last year how many heart attacks the year before last accidents. heart attack stroke whatever i mean you're getting covid daily then why is the alabama department of public health backlogged on investigating complaints against nursing facilities and other care facilities sometimes it takes two or three years and then when they do find the state guidelines have been not followed and rules are broken there are no monetary penalties or anything i mean it's just okay you broke i would the say rule. take those issues to your state representative and ask them to look into a specific and situation. i'm from elmore county can you bring that to me call me tomorrow i'll give you my number i was gonna say and I can ask about... That's good. And, so and when you run mind. them down, if you'll send them to me, we'd like to post those as well. Can, can I say yes. something just in it? You, it would be very interesting to see total deaths in Alabama in 2019 compared to total deaths in 2020. I don't care how they're classified, what, but give me total deaths, right? And, um, and I would bet you that there's probably not that much of a variance. So. Yep. Can I say something? Yes, sir. Please? Can I recognize somebody? Yes. I, I have nothing but praise to say 
uh, your chairman of your county commission of Elmore County. He's not only you the snuck best, in. He's not only the best commissioner. He's the best chairman in the state. Troy, Troy Stubbs. Troy Stubbs. Give him a round of applause. For those of you who live in Elmore County, he is the chairman of our Elmore County Commission. Stand up so they can see you. So you may want to get to know him after the meeting. Very proactive and a very good leader in this community. Y'all are very fortunate. And thank you for coming. It's good to see you. Exactly. Okay, I want, yes. Can I say one? Other? You Since may. Since we're introducing say folks, yes. I'm going to put him on the hot spot. Bill Harris. Yes, I, I was going to do him next. Okay. Go ahead. Go. You can say your Go. announcement now. Thank you, Becky. Uh, my name is Bill Harris, and I'm here on behalf of Congressman Barry Moore, who's your new congressman in the 2nd District. Um, for you who don't know, when the congressman got elected, he made a commitment that he would work to move an office, his main office, from Montgomery to either Otago or Wetumpka. We have opened an office thanks to Mayor Willis, who's made us an incredible uh, offer to work with us. So we're going to have our grand opening at the office next Tuesday from 4 to 6, and it's at the administrative building right by the um, city hall, I mean right by the Civic Center. It's 4 to 6, and then we'll have a town hall meeting after that at the Civic Center at 6. So that's one thing. The next day on the 7th, we're bringing our entire D.C. staff and state staff to Montgomery. We're going to be in Senate, Bill, uh, Senate Room 807, and they're going to be there for the members here. So if you have any questions, um, that you know, you can have access to our staff to help work with them. So um, if I can do anything to help you, let me know. But thank you. And didn't mean to jump no, in. No, that's great. And I will send out an email um, with that town hall date on the 6th so that any of you in the area, we have our emails go to everybody across the state, but that way you can. It, Barry Moore is our congressman for District 2. And the grand opening is from 4 to 6 before. And the office where he's going to be is right next to the Civic Center. It's the old bank building. It's where the, the mayor's office is now. Becky Quick, we've got another VIP in the audience that I would like to recognize, yes, too. Yes, and I bet I know who it is. For, former director of the uh, Victims of Crime in the, in the whole nation. She was a leader here in Alabama for a lot of years, a, a former victim herself. But uh, she was p appointed by Donald Trump, which is, is, is a quite, an, up, quite an accomplishment darling. to get a presidential appointment. And... Uh, and guess what? She was, such, she was such a Trump person that she went to the convention and uh, everybody in the Democratic Party knew that. So she got a, a, a goodbye thank, thank you note on the uh, inauguration day. Joe Biden no, no longer found a need for Darlene. So she's back to jo join us here in our local fight. And we're glad to have her back. Yes, Darlene. Um is very humble, but she was a huge department head at DOJ for years while, while Trump was in, and you were doing a fantastic job. I wish you were still there, but I'm glad you're back here now. So as we get ready to close, I just want to touch on the transgender bill. If you know me and you hear me on the radio, I, I live and breathe this bill. Eagle Forum did help write this bill. We have children in, the, in America that are at 13 years old getting double mastectomies. 17-year-old boys getting full genital sex reassignment surgeries. In Alabama, we have eight-year-old children, third graders, going on puberty blockers in hopes to change their sex. So we have a bill called the Vulnerable Child Compassion and Protection Act, and it bans three things for healthy minors who want to change their sex. They, puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, and sex reassignment surgeries. Once they're 19, they can do those things if they want. But what we are finding is thousands of people across the country who have transitioned, they're young adults now, and they realized that they were just being kids. And they really are the sex that they were born, but now they have health conditions that they will live, they will be patients for life because they have chemi chemically castrated themselves so they don't produce their own hormones anymore. And so for the rest of their lives, they will be, even though they are not the opposite sex anymore, they will have to deal with this. There's another part in our bill that these children, it, this is to help parents, because children go to school and they don't tell their parents that they're gender confused. They go to school, they change their clothes, they're called by a different name, different pronoun, and the parents don't have any idea, but everybody at school knows, the teacher's even calling them by the other name. We believe that parents need to know what's going on with their children. So there is a part of our bill that encourages school personnel 
to not coerce a child to keep that information from their parents and that they won't withhold that information from their parents. There's no criminal penalties whatsoever for those school personnel, but we're just trying to point out that these parents want to help their children. They love their children. They need to know what's going on. Another thing I want you to just be aware of with trans, we need to have a whole night on transgenderism and this bill and what this is doing. Gender dysphoria is a mental condition. It is an identity disorder, just like someone who has anorexia. They are a normal person or even they may be emaciated, but in their heads they believe that they're fat. Would it be ethical for a doctor to tell them to get gastric bypass surgery or to take diet pills or to get liposuction? No. Every mental illness like this, an identity disorder, we do not affirm the delusion. We help them get back to reality. But in America, we have lost our minds and we are now telling children who think they were born in the wrong body that they were born and let's do some surgery and try to help them. These are not reversible treatments. They're not treatments. They're interventions or procedures, and they are not reversible. One of our girls that testified for us on this bill last year, she began to transition. To, she wanted to be a male. She started right before she was 17 years old. She started taking hormones, cross-sex hormones. Within a year, her health was so horrible, she almost died. She was in the ER many times. She finally, her grandpa talked her into really dealing with the unhappiness and the things going on in her mind and helped her get back to reality. So she stopped after about a year. She looks like a girl, she's, she's a girl, but she has a male voice and she will always have a male voice. And she said, she just mentioned the other day, it's so embarrassing for her when she goes into the restroom and she's at the sink and someone start, stri strikes up a conversation she looks fully like a girl, but as soon as she opens her mouth, it's very deep, and it totally sounds like a man, and they look at her weird. And she will have this stigma for the rest of her life. You guys, this is something that's not going away. This is something that is being pushed across our country, in our schools, with this administration, and I want you to know the truth, and I want you to speak the truth. Boys cannot become girls. Girls cannot become boys. And did you know that 98%, up to 98% of children who are gender dysphoric or gender confused, if you allow them to go through natural puberty, 98% will come out on the other end and accept their sex self. But what do we do? Remember tomboys when we were kids? They were such a tomboy at the time, but you know what? They went through puberty, they went into young adults, and now they're fine with who they are. It's okay to be a tomboy. It's okay to be a tom girl. You don't have to change and say you're the opposite sex. So speak the truth and speak it boldly because we're getting shamed and we're self-censoring ourselves from this. Okay, Charlotte, please vote for SB 10. Uh, tell your representatives it's passed the House, it's passed the Senate, and it's going to be debated next week in the House. Yes, ma'am. Is it on the calendar? We it's going to be next week, okay. Thursday, Glad probably. Glad to know that. Yeah. So, being on the health committee, I started getting information. Being on the health committee, I started getting information about this really quickly this session. So I've done a lot of reading. I honestly believe that this is the agenda of the LBTQ, whatever the rest of the alphabet says, is to make us all think that this is normal, so that their activities can be normal. And you, you may call me paranoid and delusional, but you know it's coming. It's real and it, it, it's out to get our children. And that's what we're fighting. So, can I mention one other set of bills that have yep. passed through and already been signed by the governor? We had a military, a set of military bills to make Alabama the friendliest state in the country to military families. And we got those bills passed, mostly along the lines, and I'm speaking to you in case your spouse needs this, but mostly along the lines of making sure that spouses have reciprocity across all areas. I carried the bill for medical spouses to be able to get a, a license as quick as a, a temporary license, um, but we passed it along the lines of psychiatrists, dentists, LPNs, nurses, nurse practitioners, all that. 
t teachers. I think we did. I think we've covered just about everything we could carry cover. But that was Lieutenant Governor Ainsworth that really worked hard on that, and um, we've got all those passed. The They're yeah, all. The no, I'm Military sorry. And... Didn't mean to say two. Okay. Okay, with that said, you know, I am a time cruncher and it is 7.59, so we are going to call it quits. If you don't get our emails, go to, um, out, oh, she's got a sign-up sheet out there. That is Lori. If you have a teen, she runs our Teen Eagle program for the state. She would love to talk to you. She's got some great things going on. Plan to meet back here the last Monday of April. We will have another meeting I'll fill you in on what that exciting topic is going to be later, but be sure to get our emails and take a minute and give these guys a great round of applause. Thank you for coming. <laughs>